Good. Someone from the AUE department, please report to the stage. You're a very smart man. Okay, you guys can hear me now, right? Okay. This is a special priest mic, though, so I can't hear <laughs> It's the conch shell. I'm Jennifer Granick. I'm a criminal defense attorney, and I practice out of San Francisco, California. I'm going to talk to you today a bit about the laws that are related to hacking, and I'm going to go through the Fourth and Fifth Amendment in a very brief and sketchy way, just to give people some idea of exactly what their rights are. Because certainly we have laws that criminalize things we do, but we also have laws that protect the things we do, so we'll try to look at the law as something that uh, both is a force for good and for evil. Um, with me today is Grant Gottfried. He is a policy analyst, and I'm going to be turning over a portion of our time today to talk about the law to him. He's going to discuss the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, which is a law that protects your data privacy, basically email uh, privacy. So um, I will take questions during my speech if anybody has them. The first thing I want to do is I want to address some questions that were raised. Oh, and I apologize for my complete lack of uh, visual materials. I am a uh, Luddite when it comes to PowerPoint, and I forgot to tell our uh, fine helping people who are helping with the AV stuff that I require an overhead projector. So you guys are going to have to imagine what I'm talking about as we go along, which should be pretty clear. Uh, the first statute that you need to know about when you're talking about uh, the federal hacking law is Section 1030. We heard quite a bit about it this morning, so I'm not going to really get into it, but I do want to address a couple issues that were raised regarding 1030 this morning. The first thing is the question of what is unauthorized? What is authorization? And this is a very serious issue. Um, I practice in this area and have represented several people who are charged with this crime, so what I can tell you about authorization is this. In practice, the way that the courts are dealing with authorization is that if the victim says, I didn't mean for him to be able to do that, he wasn't authorized to do it, that is basically enough. Okay, so we're not really talking about a heavy standard for authorization. This raises the question that was uh, discussed before that a gentleman who was sitting somewhere in this area, this gentleman right here raised, uh, which was an excellent question, it was my question, but he asked it a lot better, about an anonymous FTP server that's set up in a certain way, it's set up in a way that the person who established it doesn't think that people have access, but in fact the people do. Um, I encounter this all the time where permissions are set a certain way, or uh, the system is configured in such a way that with no tools, without breaking anything, people have access. Um, and the question is, since the permissions were set up to allow access, did the person have permission to access the system? Um, and as technical people, you probably think the answer to that question ought to be yes. But in practice, the law seems to be answering that question, no depends upon what was in the uh, mind of the victim. So that requires us to be something of mind readers at times. It's sort of unfortunate. Um, then let's defer now to the very gentleman whose question that was. He's saying, does the law protect the stupidity of the person for setting up their server in such a way that people have access when they didn't mean them to? And at least as far as the criminal law is, uh, it seems like the answer to that is yes. And unfortunately, that requires us as law-abiding citizens to be something of mind readers, where we're really trying to guess what it was that the victim meant for us to be able to do. Now, there are some situations where you are have permission to do something, you're able to do something, but you kind of know that the people don't want you to do it. And I had a case like this where um, somebody was, uh, ISP was running a buggy version of uh, web server software that allowed you to type a certain URL and number of keystrokes into the go-to box on your uh, Netscape Navigator or uh, Internet Explorer if you use that product. And uh, it would reveal to you the encrypted password file, which then you could copy and run Lovecraft against and get a whole uh, list of passwords. And it was you know, easy to do. I could do it. Really, anybody could do it do it, um, but because they, uh, basically the way the court looks at it is, you're supposed to know that you're not get, supposed to get these people's password files, so it is unauthorized in that, in that sense. 
I just want to run through a few other things about 1030. Port scanning is okay under the law so far. Somebody asked about what if, whether a failed attack would not be uh, illegal under 1030 because there's no damage caused because you failed. Well, the law does not reward stupidity when it comes to the defendant. Uh, we have a word for failed attacks, and it's an attack and attempt crimes are illegal. So if you attempt to break into a server and that is a violation of 1030, even though you fail, you can still be prosecuted. Um, the, then finally there was the question about juveniles, which I was very concerned with. I don't want anybody at this conference to come away from it with the idea that because they are under 18, they can break into people's boxes with impunity. Okay, first of all, we have state laws that prohibit that. So do not do that because you can be prosecuted under the state law. Second of all, um, I understand that uh, the uh, people from the FBI and from the uh, Department of Justice have said that uh, federal authorities cannot prosecute juveniles under 1030. But I do know, for example, and you all may have heard of the case involving the Cloverdale kids and the, I think it's the Solar Sunrise kids, uh, the greatest attack on Department of Defense computers that we've seen to date, 14-year-olds from Cloverdale, California, and uh, they were prosecuted and ended up getting convictions for that. So I'm not sure exactly what the answer is to that and why it is that federal authorities are saying they can't prosecute. Maybe they were prosecuted under federal law but through the state system. Maybe they were prosecuted under state law and I'm going to find that out. But please, please do not think that being under 18 is a, is a pass, okay? Tell your people who weren't in the, who aren't in the room now. Um, finally, uh, the right, just a question about viruses. Writing virus or other uh, dangerous code is not illegal. Posting viruses or other dangerous codes are not illegal, both because the law doesn't cover it and also because there are these cases of actual court rulings that say that code is speech. And as speech, it's protected under the First Amendment that we have here and enjoy the pleasure of in the United States. Um, so posting it under normal circumstances would not be illegal. Now, there are circumstances I can imagine under which you would post code that would incur a criminal or other legal liability for you. For example, if I posted a, it, a little link to it or download here and I said, download this, it's going to um, give you this cool, neat program that's going to do something fun for you, and I'm encouraging people to download it and actually it's going to break their system, that's a circumstance where I have the intent to transmit it. I'm trying to get it transmitted to other people's computers. Computers, that wouldn't be okay. But if I put up a warning like, be careful, this is very dangerous, I'm posting it for research purposes, people should be aware of this, um, and you put up you know, disclaimers and you're responsible about it, then you should generally be uh, pretty okay. And uh, it's probably a, something of a fact-specific circumstance with regards to that. So those are the things I want to just say about 1030. And you, sir? Yeah, you said that uh, you I think it's one of those gray areas because you're talking about whether you're knowingly, knowingly transmitting it or intending to transmit it to cause the harm, and I, I think it's a question. I mean, a Trojanized program being out there without any warning, I think you're really, really, that's suspect. I'd be, I'd be concerned, basically. Um, you know, these are all, a lot of the technology moves really quick, and uh, there's not a lot of case law on this. Unfortunately, not many of these cases go to trial, so we don't get a lot of court rulings or anything on it. So oftentimes we're sort of dealing here in kind of a legal gray area, and I think that that would be kind of suspect or dangerous behavior. I'll take one more question, please, before I move on.
question is, um, how how far will it, you know where the user who's, who's uh, is unwittingly gaining the unauthorized access? And there's going to be a question of you know know what what the uh, user knew, and there's also going to be a question of uh, how they could have known. Because uh, another aspect of it is if it's so easy to get in that you don't even know that you're not supposed to be there. Um, like if there's a big welcome banner, but in the person's subjective mind, they're like, well, everybody's welcome except for people from New Jersey, and you're from New Jersey, and you just happen upon the site. You know, you're talking about. You, it's not purely subjective in the victim's mind. And your question was also related to how far will they go when the information is classified and the person doesn't even know the value of what they might find on the server. And, uh, you know, obviously the government's very sensitive about classified information, but generally they'll just look at the overall case and see whether they think they have enough evidence to meet all the elements. And there is a knowledge element. You can't simply be, you know, typing in your sleep or having no idea what you're doing and still be convicted. Does that answer your question? Okay, let me move on and then we can... Well, Well, I, I don't see how there's any, I mean, that's something that's open to the public, so I don't see how the access is unauthorized there. So maybe I don't understand your question, but... Yeah, that's what I'm saying, is that if it's open to the, uh, that, I mean, that's basically what I'm saying. That it is subjective in the, the, what the way that the courts have dealt with it is that um, if is there's some, well, I think I answered it basically. The way that the courts have dealt with it is if there's something that you kind of are supposed to know that you shouldn't be having, like the password file, even if it's otherwise very easy to access, the courts may say that that was unauthorized access or you exceeded authorized access by getting this particular information. Um, so the fact that permissions are set in a certain way or that something is open to the public is not necessarily the be-all and end-all of the question. But if you have something that's anonymous FTP open to the public, regardless of what's in the person's subjective mind, that's something that's so obviously meant for public consumption, I don't think they would be able to meet the unauthorized access element of the crime. Okay. Um, let me move on to some other statutes that I want to cover because I've got a lot to do here in a little time. Uh, credit cards, PIN numbers, um, Blue boxes, these are all, possession of these things is all potentially illegal under 18 U.S.C. section 1029, which prohibits the uh, unlawful possession of access devices. PIN code uh, is an access device as is a machine, like a blue box. Um, the hallmark of this crime is not just possession, but in possession with intent to defraud. Now, intent to defraud is not something that uh, is necessarily as hard to prove as you might think because the way that courts often look at this is if you possess something and there's no real legitimate reason for having it, it's susceptible to only one use and that is an illegal or fraudulent use, they're going to argue that you possessed it with intent to defraud. And often we've seen uh, the prosecutor use things like people's books or uh, manuals or other things that they're interested in. You, know, you have uh, somebody who's got a blue box and then they've also got, you know, cellular phone hackers, Bible or something like that. And that becomes, you know, very powerful evidence that the person is possessing with intent to defraud. It's not evidence of one's curiosity. It's evidence of one's criminality. So you need to be careful of things like that. Another statute is misappropriation of trade secrets. This is 18 U.S.C. section 1831. Um, what's a trade misappropriation? Well, let's just sum it up as theft, uh, although there's a couple of different things that fit under that term. But let's just talk a little bit about what trade secrets are. A trade secret is all forms of information that the owner has taken reasonable measures to keep secret and which derives independent economic value, actual or potential, from not being generally known to and not being readily ascertainable through proper means by the public. So there's your definition of trade secret. Um, and for many people, this is like, what else would you want to know except the trade secrets? But you've got to be very careful when uh, dealing with this type of information, particularly in the employer-employee context. This comes up quite a bit, either when somebody reveals something unwittingly or moves from one employer to another employer and has had access to uh, proprietary trade secret information. So that's just something to be careful about. 
The criminal copyright law is at 18 U.S.C. section 2319. This prohibits unauthorized copying of copyrighted materials um, that are in value of excess of, uh, I believe it's $500 is the limit nowadays, regardless of whether your copying is for profit or not. So that's regardless of whether you're selling it or giving it away. Um, basically, if I have a copy of Microsoft Word and I make one for my dad and one for my sister, I'm a criminal. So be careful with that one as well. Um, interception of or access to electronic communications, which for an example is email or uh, wire communications, telephone calls, uh, is criminalized under 18 U.S.C. section 2702 and 2511. I just want to point out that this is really the law that criminalizes sniffers, okay? Um, because a sniffer is capturing electronic communications as it comes across the wire. And I want to also point out that the federal sentencing guidelines, which tell you how much time you're going to do in the joint for having a sniffer, are very high. Um, the base level, if you don't know much about the sentencing guidelines, this won't mean much to you, but the base offense level is nine. So you're already like way up there in those federal sentencing guidelines. It's hard to get back to an area where you're going to be able to get probation for a situation like that. So sniffers, very bad, very bad. I'll take a question over here. Mm. The question is, if it's illegal to read somebody else's email, how come the boss can do it? And I'll cover that. Yeah, I know. Grant's going to cover that, but in short, it's the uh, it's the business provider, business exception to the statute. But Grant will cover it in a little more detail. Um, and finally, I want to mention wire fraud, which is 18 U.S.C. section 1343. Okay, wire fraud is one of the broadest crimes we have. And basically, it requires a scheme to defraud and the defendant transmits a wire communication in furtherance of that scheme. Okay, so what does that bring to mind? What about social engineering? Can social engineering be wire fraud? I think that there's a good likelihood that social engineering can be prosecuted under the wire fraud statutes. And in fact, that uh, was a substantial part of the case against Kevin Mitnick. So if I have a scheme to defraud, which is to obtain something I can't get, like trade secrets from Nokia or Motorola, and I make a wire communication, which is a telephone call to people saying, hey, you know, can you set me up an account? and that's supposed to help me get into the company so that then I can get the information out, we're looking at wire fraud. So wire fraud, very broad, and it can apply to a huge range of activities. So you've got to be really careful about something like that as well. I'll take this question. Okay, he asked me about, he said, well, I said code is covered because that's a First Amendment thing, but what about reverse engineering? And this is a very good and complicated question. There is a statute that relates to reverse engineering, and it's the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, a relatively new and extremely complicated statute. Um, this is where the DVD suits are coming from. And basically what happened there is uh, they had DCS, DCSS uh, encryption for DVDs, which prevented you from playing them anywhere you wanted, uh, even from country to from what machines sold in one country to machines sold in another country. And people reverse engineered it and cracked it so that they could play their DVDs on machines, you know, any machine they were, they had, whether they were in France or in the United States or in uh, Norway. And there are provisions of the DMCA that prohibit this kind of uh, circumvention of copyright specifically. So that's a problem with reverse engineering. There's also been um, movements in the uh, World Intellectual Property Organization and in the United States Congress to have laws that in effect would criminalize reverse engineering. And the industry has been uh, pretty responsive and vocal to trying to point out to legislators who are not very knowledgeable about this kind of thing how these laws could affect uh, reverse engineering and creativity. So it's kind of a gray area. There's a lot of different uh, laws that apply to it, but it's not as clear uh, as the code uh, circumstance is, but we're litigating things on that topic right now, and it's it's a that's a pretty dynamic and exciting area of the law, but definitely an issue. Um, I wouldn't stop reverse engineering anything right at this point in time, but be aware that there are uh, legal issues associated with it. I'll take one more question.
the question is, why does this apply to people overseas? Why can't you just leave the oppressive United States and go do it somewhere else? And the answer to that is because a lot of these laws are, um, are multilateral. We have the World Intellectual Property Organization Treaty, or the WIPO Treaty, which covers a lot of these things. And there's a number of countries that are signatories to this treaty, which um, also follow this law. So there are uh, international inter intellectual property laws, for example, that, that deal with this kind of thing. So it's not just a question of the United States borders, but it, there is uh, other there are other countries that do this. I mean, there are also countries that don't uh, enforce intellectual property laws as a matter of course, and those may be more of a safe haven for this kind of thing. But as a general rule, it's not just about the United States. There's other uh, other jurisdictions that will prosecute you as well. One more question about the law, and then I'm moving on to the Fourth Amendment. So uh, if we can affect other countries, can other countries affect us? And the answer to that is yes. I mean, we sign these, there's a couple different ways. First of all, we can sign multilateral treaties where a bunch of different countries agree that this is the law that we're going to follow. Also, we can, um, through politics, influence the laws that other countries pass so that their laws more clear, more uh, accurately reflect ours. Um, we have some influence over things like uh, the Council of Europe, which has a uh, effort to make a general cybercrime statute, cybercrime laws that will cover Cover, the Europe, cover Europe as a whole. And we may also have individual treaties with other countries, individual other countries, which say that they will extradite people back to the United States for certain types of crimes. So um, there is, well, you know, the long arm of the United States law can reach beyond our jurisdictional borders under um, certain circumstances and vice versa, um, often because these are multi, you know, these, these treaties go both ways. So let's move on to the, one of my favorite topics, and hopefully one of yours, the Fourth Amendment. Uh, the Fourth Amendment is the right to be free from unreasonable searches and seizures. The uh, hallmark here is uh, unreasonable, so it's not the right to be free from every search and seizure, but only those that go beyond the pale of reasonableness. The first question that you ask yourself when you're saying, is this search illegal? And by search, what do I mean? I mean the cops knocking on your door and coming inside. I mean them stopping your car. I mean them frisking you or looking in your purse, which actually happened to me last night because I left my bag at the craps table. When I came back, it was gone. They told me it was at security. And by the time I got to the security, they had everything that was in it, like laid out on the table, and they were inventorying it, which is like a nightmare for me. That's why I dream about that at night. Um, fortunately, I got there just in time, and uh, they gave the thing back to me. But So the question is reasonable expectation of privacy. And uh, that is the, if there is no reasonable expectation of privacy, the Fourth Amendment does not apply. You have it in your house, you have it to some extent in your car, in your personal effects, in your handbag, in your wallet, but uh, you don't have it in everything. And here's an example of something that uh, you don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy in, your trash. So all that um, dumpster diving that you're doing is great and fine because you don't own, nobody owns that anymore. Once you throw it out, you've given up your ownership interest in it and it's fair game for anybody. In fact, Microsoft's trash is fair game for Oracle to dig through, so um, you can dig through Microsoft's trash too, and you should be on at least a sound legal footing as Oracle is. Of course, the flip side of that is that the uh, law enforcement can dig through your garbage, so if you've got anything bad in there, you might want in to invest in a shredder, uh, but basically that's the first question, reasonable expectation of privacy. If there is a reasonable expectation of privacy, the next question is, is there probable cause? And probable cause means, is it more likely than not that, uh, that uh, you, this is going to be evidence of a crime or evidence that you committed a crime? So it's, a, you know, very, uh, is it probable that there's going to be evidence of a crime? So that's just basically what it means. And the question is, for a uh, basic one, it's not an extremely high standard for law enforcement to meet. Um, so if there is probable cause, you move on to the next question, which is, is there a warrant? Because uh, for searches to be legal under the Fourth Amendment, there has to be a warrant based on probable cause. Now, let's say there's no warrant. Uh, a w then the question, if there is a warrant, then generally the search is legal, unless there was something wrong with the probable cause or something wrong with the way that the warrant was issued. But let's assume that there's no warrant, because the vast majority of searches that occur here in the United States occur without warrant. And the question is, is there an exception to the warrant requirement? And there's a couple of uh, 
characteristic exceptions to the warrant requirement that we see all the time, and I'm just going to mention a few of them. The first one is the vehicle search. Okay, this started out as a uh, not so broad of a exception, but has grown into a huge exception. The basic thing you should think of is that when you walk down the street, you enjoy the pleasures of the Fourth Amendment. But the interior of your car is a Fourth Amendment free zone. Okay, you don't have it there. It doesn't exist there. Once you get in your car, you're basically fair game. And there's a couple of reasons for that, but uh, the case law on this from the Supreme Court has gone so far that a passenger in a car is no, if there's probable cause to believe that the driver of the car has committed a crime, then the police may search the personal effects of the passenger of the car, even without any reason to believe that the passenger may be involved in any kind of illegal activity. So interior of a car is not your safest place to be if you're uh, hoping for the protections of the United States Constitution. The second major uh, example uh, or uh, exception to the warrant requirement is consent. So if you let the police into your house and you've consented to it, it's not unreasonable. Now why do people consent to be searched, consent to be patted down, consent to let police officers into their house? Well, the primary reason is because this is what police officers are trained to do. They're trained to get information where otherwise they wouldn't be able to get it. And believe me, they're very, very good at it. And they play upon people's innate uh, either fear of police or fear of authority or desire to, appe to appease authority in getting people to consent. Um, oftentimes I've seen where even when the person stands firm and doesn't consent to allow the police to search, they'll just search anyway and then say that the guy said it was okay. But where the law operates as it should, um, if there's no consent and there's no other exceptions and there's no warrant, then there's no search. And finally, the other really broad category is the category of exigent circumstances, um, which is anything that creates such a sense of emergency that the search is authorized. This can be anything from a public safety exception where uh, if they don't do the search, somebody might be injured, to um, the situation where uh, they knock on the door of a crack house and they hear the toilet flushing and they think that there's destruction of evidence as they flush the narcotics down the toilet. That also has been held to be an exigent circumstance which would allow the police to then bust down the door and go into the house. Um, if there's not an exception, then it is an illegal search. Okay, so that's basically a very sketchy version of the Fourth Amendment. I'm going to take two questions and I'm going to skip the Fifth Amendment because I want to make sure that Grant has time and then we'll definitely have a good period for questions at the end. Um, so, uh, the, the gentleman in the blue shirt. He's asking me whether compiled binary is uh, also protected speech the same as source code. And um, I would say that the you'd have to take a look at the exact language of the case, which is the Bernstein case. But I think that uh, basically the case has a rather broad holding, which says that um, because it's expressive, because code is expressive, it is protected speech. And I think that both those examples are expressive. It doesn't necessarily matter, matter exactly what form it comes in as long as it has the expressive element. Do you need to follow up on that? I think the opinion compares the code to the wheel on a player piano, which to the you know naked eye doesn't seem to mean or do anything. We don't really know what that is or what the music is, but it nonetheless is a uh, is something that is the it, it creates the expression in the player piano. So I, I like I said, I think that it, it also would fit in under that because I think the analogy to the I think the analogy that the court's making between other expressive things and, and code fits for uh, fits for that as well. Um, you with the reddish hair. Is that okay that I said that? Okay. <laughs> Uh, 
Okay, he's asking me about um, the, I said that the cars, for, huh? I said that the car. I'm looking for someone, sorry. He asked me about the car and uh, what I said about it being Fourth Amendment free zone. He asked me about other things like a motorcycle or a bike and the trunk of a car. And the trunk of a car also is that, uh, you know, sort of fits in. This, it, the, the exceptions developed. And initially there were different rules for the trunk of the car and for the passenger compartment and all of that. But generally, I think, and could then containers in the trunk or containers in the uh, glove compartment and all of that. But I think the easy answer to that is that once it's in the car, um, you're really looking at it being something that's searchable. I can walk down the street with a box and it has first Fourth Amendment protection. But when I put it in the trunk of the car, it's gone. Now, the sad thing about this isn't motorcycles or bicycles. The sad thing about this is mobile homes, okay, in which people live. And just by the very nature of the fact that it is mobile, courts have held that the vehicle exception to the warrant requirement applies to that, even though it's somebody's house. So if you can drive it away, they can search it. <laughs> I know. The law is not often definable by these very bright line rules, but that's, a, that's pretty much basically true. So um, I'm, because of my time constraints, I'm going to turn it over to Grant right now, and um, we'll probably be able to have about 10 or 15 minutes after for questions. Bicycles and motorcycles. You can move it, you can search it. Thanks, Jen, for a job well done, as always. And we will be taking more questions at the end. What is ACPA? It's the Electronic Crimes Prevention Act. And before I go into too much detail, I have a question for all of you. And that is, how many of you have set up, run a POP3, IMAP, BBS that you can send emails on, or any type of email server? That's a good percentage of the room. You're going to find out very quickly why you care about ECPA. And one of that is the key terms. The key term in ECPA is electronic communication service. And that is, it's very well defined, 2510, any service which provides the users thereof the ability to send or receive wire or electronic communication. The other one is remote computing service, which we don't really have enough time to cover. That means that every one of you who raised your hand, you are regulated by ECPA, whether you realize it or not. Another key term is in electronic storage. And you might think that it means any data stored electronically, because that would make sense. Well, you'd be wrong. It has a very specific definition, and it is very key to understanding ECPA. And it is any temporary intermediate storage of a wire or electronic communication incidental to the electronic transmission thereof, or basically that backed up. So how is email protected? Well, it's a misdemeanor, as it was covered, to access a facility within or in excess of authority and thereby obtain, alter, or prevent authorized access to wire or electronic communication in electronic storage. It's interesting to note here that you ha it is both of those. You have to access it with without or in excess of authority. Now, there's some exceptions, and this covers one of the, que the questions that the gentleman over there had, was that the criminal provision does not provide to the provider. The provider can read your email all at once. But there's some more specifics about that that we need to get into in a minute, but uh, I'm going to cover the government first. Obviously, the user, the user has an exception if the message was intended for that user, and the government if it follows the proper procedures. Well, the provider, so the provider can read all of your email, but can the provider give that email to the government? The answer is... a. It's, it's distinctive between a provider to the public and a provider to the private. Now, a public provider is AT&T, Hotmail, Yahoo, and uh, anybody that you can buy an account from, essentially, or any free email provider. Those are providers to the public. They cannot disclose content except to those shown, the addressees, otherwise authorized by certain state statutes, lawful consent, or uh, necessary to incident to the rendition of service or to protect the rights or property of the provider. That means that if it finds an email that it feels that it could be liable for, it can disclose that under the statute. It can also disclose to a forwarder or to law enforcement if the contents are inadver inadvertently obtained and appear to pertain to the commission of a crime. So what does this mean? Well, I send you an email. 
the email gets to the server, but you're, you're not at home, you're out partying, so you don't read the email that night. Well, your ISP backs that server up and puts that over here. Right now, it is in electronic storage, referencing the key term. Next morning, uh, next afternoon, you wake up and read the email. You decide, I'm going to leave this email on the server. Now, it is not in electronic storage. Why? Because you had an opportunity to protect that email by deleting it, downloading it, whatever, but you decided that it wasn't important enough, so you left it on the server. So therefore, it is no longer in electronic storage. The backup from the night before, that's still in electronic storage. But the, the email that you left there is not. Private providers, schools, your employer, any system that does not give accounts to the public have no prohibitions on disclosure. Your workplace can turn over your email to law enforcement anytime it pleases unless it has other civil contractual um, with, the, with you. No. Um, because it, it, it's still limited to those enrolled within the school. And I had that exact same question, and I, I looked into that wondering, and the answer is that they are private providers. Uh, there was a case, actually, um, Anderson versus somebody or another, that questioned on what a provi private provider is. Microsoft.com's internal email, even though it accesses the internet, is private is counts as a private provider so whether or not it accesses the internet or not has nothing to do with it all it is is who gets access legal access to that email who are accounts handed out to yes doesn't matter if you requ if it requires tuition then uh, you know if it's something that not anyone can just get it's a private provider there's no disclosure on pro there's no prohibitions on disclosures. I, I cannot stress that enough. Well, well, they don't have to turn it over unless it, it depends. There's no prohibitions on disclosure. Oh, I'm sorry. The question was that the employer would be advised to make a policy that says that it's private. That depends on the em employer and what they feel. Um, I know there was some, and Jennifer um, might might remember this as well. There was some. There are some instances in which the provider might be liable for email that it, one of its employees send, and so that's one of the reasons why they have complete access to disclose to view your email or whatever. It's it's up to the provider there, really. The government. There's three levels of access. There's basic subscriber information, other subscriber information, and content. And all three of these require different levels to obtain. First is basic subscriber information. The government can obtain, with, without notice, you'll never know, with a subpoena, your name, address, local and long distance telephone toll billing records, telephone number, other subscriber information or identity, such as um, ISDN numbers, uh, or in length of service and types of services utilized. All with a subpoena, you'll never know about it. Other subscriber information. Um, this might be, um, they want to know who John Doe at AOL.com is sending email to because they know he's sending kitty porn and they want to know who, it, who it's being sent to. That, they have to get a court order for this. And this came out of, this was actually a step up from what it used to be. It used to only be a subpoena. But this was, this was put in as a result of CALEA, which is, is it's a separate law. And it was a compromise which actually put this up to a court order. And there's a special, it's actually a little bit uh, different from most court orders, that it has to be relevant and material to an ongoing criminal investigation. And lastly, there's content. And a governmental entity can only require the disclosure of content of an electronic communication and electronic storage 180 days or less only pursuant to a warrant. 
Um, there's, there's never been, as far as I'm aware, any time that the hundred that they've searched, they've wanted email older than 180 days. But the law specifically does make a distinction between email less than 180 days or older than 180 days. The um, okay. if it's more than 180 days in storage. Then they have a few more options. Uh, they can do it without notice to the, to the subscriber with a warrant, with notice to the subscriber with a variety of subpoenas, or they can get a court order under a pre the previous statute and delay notice using 2705. Uh, once again, this has never come up as far as I'm aware. Now, this is an extreme. Yes. No, they're not. Um, and, but there, there is a, 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 what I'm about to talk about right here in the preservation of evidence, he asked our uh, public providers, do they have to maintain mail for 180 days? And the answer is no. But there is a law under 2703F, and this is, remember, all of you who raised your hands are regulated by ECPA. This applies to you. A provider, upon request of a governmental entity, which all it has to be is a letter, shall take all necessary steps to preserve records and other evidence in its possession pending the issuance of a court order or other process. That means if the government sends a letter to AT&T saying, we're going to go get a subpoena, we want you to hold on to those records, they then do have to hold on to them for 90 days. And then at the end of that 90 days, they, the government can request an additional 90 days with a separate form. Yes? Somebody was up there just earlier and said she keeps no records whatsoever under her email and everything. You're saying right now the government's in the law. Unfortunately, it's just kind of stuck. If there's no backup system or anything like that, you know, go spend money to provide that sort of a solution. He asked, um, that Noyes was up here earlier with the remailer and said that she doesn't keep any records. Um, the answer is, if there's no records to keep, then they can't preserve them. <laughs> can I, let me just add a little bit to that if I can. Um, the thing with that is, they can ask you to preserve records that already exist. They cannot ask you to intercept records that are forthcoming, because that would be an intercept under the, Title uh, under Title, it would be a, a, a ECPA, it comes under this statute, but it's like a Title III intercept where you need to have a different standard to collect prospectively content. Because really what that is, is that's an intercept. And to intercept electronic communications, you need a wiretap warrant, which is a warrant plus minimization and all these other things. So no, they cannot force her to create the records. You can only ask somebody to preserve records that have already been accumulated. Right. It, it's well, if you don't have the ability to do it, you haven't done it. So they can't force you to do it prospectively. If you, if you hold the records for five days, then if they send you a request within those five days, you're legally bound to hold those records that are already created for 90 days while the government goes and gets... <laughs> Yes. That's the law. That's the law. Uh, I, I, I don't make the law. I don't. I, uh, yes. She was asking, is there a provision regarding credit cards? If you accept uh, e-commerce information, do you have to keep those records? I, I believe it, it's not under ECPA, but it's under... It, it, I believe that it's there, but I do not remember the statute number. Uh, our, our Fed. He's saying that you can charge the government for your costs for having to store email. But let's move on because Grant's got a lot to cover. Real quick, I'm, I'm almost done. Yes. Can a provider request the actual 
what is what can the provider request for authenticity? I.e., they receive a letter where they need to store the data for 90 days. What can they request of the government to verify that this is a Like, do they need to subpoena? This is, they're not turning anything over at this. He asked what, what kind of authenticity is required. They're not turning anything over at this point. They just have to preserve it. As long as it's from a legal governmental entity, they have to preserve it for that number of days. Nothing is being turned over to law enforcement at this point. They just have to preserve it with their, within their uh, own servers. I just said, there's one last slide and then we'll be done. So what, what happens about ECPA violations? Constitutional violations are subject to the usual sanctions, but civil remedies are only available for non-constitutional violations under 2707. That means you can sue the government. That's it. There, it, it there's no criminal um, violations other than already specified under 2701. Now, now both Jen and I will. Well, I just want to, before we go for the question, I just want to say one thing. ECPA stands for Electronic Communications Privacy Act. Prevention Act. Privacy. Is it privacy? You sure? Yeah. <laughs> Electronic Communications Privacy Act. Um, okay, uh, let's take questions. Uh, you'll be next, but you, sir. What's the case of the problem here? Let's say He asked me, will we be forced to provide the key to your encrypted data? And unfortunately... Let's say I sent a PGP email. And for some reason, Big Brother wants to take a look at it, and they said, we don't have the five years over the email. Can they request that they provide me with all the keys? How can they get it? If you have encrypted stuff and you've got the key, can they force you to turn it over? And this is something, unfortunately, I wasn't able to really touch on, but the Fifth Amendment would apply in some ways to this. So if the key if the passphrase was solely in your mind, then I think the case law is pretty clear that the government can't force you to tell them what the key is because it's in your mind and that is forcing you to produce something that may be incriminating or not. And that is, a, that is a, goes contrary to the Fifth Amendment. The cases are a little bit difficult, more difficult if, the, if it's written down, for example, if your passphrase is written down. Well, in PGP, you're not, it's not the passphrase. Um, let's, take, uh, let's take this gentleman who I said could be next. <laughs> um, those, those slides obviously, uh, is there a reference for that you give us for these kids for more information on these He asked, is there a web resource uh, regarding more information about ECPA? Um, there's the, basically, I, the, where I would go is the usdoj.gov. Um, they they have some information there. It, it's n not extreme. It, depending on what you're looking for, you might just want to look at the statute. But if you're looking for case law and stuff, I don't know of any sp other websites other than the governments that are just dedicated. The, the to computer crime and intellectual property section of the Department of Justice has a website that has a lot of stuff about that on it. Cybercrime.gov. Can we have the gentleman in the hat? Yes, you. So he's in what, what, he, what he's asking about is a little kung fu on the uh, law enforcement. So they say that you know you can't come into somebody else's box if they don't mean for you to be there. What about if I don't mean for law enforcement to be allowed into my box? Can I sort of reverse the 1030 on them? And that's going to depend upon a, a lot of. Uh, that's a very com good but complicated question. It's going to depend on a lot of things in terms of uh, how they gained access, what kind of information they were accessing, and um, whether they had any court authority or anything like that. But basically, law enforcement's not allowed to break the law any more than you are. And if the access is truly unauthorized, then uh, no, they wouldn't be allowed to do that. But do keep in mind that sometimes the what's good for the goose is not good for the gander, and law enforcement may receive a benefit of the doubt where you would not as a, as a citizen. So you, my answer is yes, maybe. 
Okay, I'm going to take two more questions. I'll take this eager gentleman right here. He asked me whether the law allows the defendant to hire a forensic expert to testify for them about how the evidence was collected or anything like that. And the answer to that is yes. In fact, um, that's a constitutionally protected right under the Sixth Amendment. Part of having the right to counsel is the right to have somebody who helps your counsel with understanding the technical things. And this goes to the question that was asked by the lady over here earlier. Often, you know, attorneys can't know everything, so oftentimes we do rely upon our experts to help us with the difficult technological issues. It's hard for us to be uh, knowledgeable in all the areas at all the times. So uh, one last question, I'll, you, sir, would the, uh, yes, you. <laughs> Grant, do you want to answer that or do you want me to? I, I, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? He asked whether or not uh, if there is a corporate use policy or some agreement with the users that the network's going to be sniffed, um, does that make it okay for them to do it? Yeah, there's, there's some, you're going into some civil law there. Are you asking? Well, let, let me just answer it since we're, the, the answer is yes, you can. Yes. And the reason is because it's actually not a 1030 violation. It really is an ECPA violation. And the EPCPA has a very broad exception for the service provider. provider but it also has an exception for consent. So there you've got both. You've got the service provider exception and you've got consent. So you want to sniff your own network, you go right ahead. Same thing. In corporate realm, same thing. Yeah. They can, inside of a corporate, if they tell you you have no expectation of privacy, you have no expectation of privacy. Then you're, then you're, you're going to get fired. Yeah, you'd you're get fired. But you're not going to get criminally prosecuted. If your terms of employment, you'd be fired. I'm going to accept illegally one more question from this gentleman here, just for the hell of it. So the question is, can the government go through Hotmail's backups and access email that I've deleted from my personal inbox? With the proper authority, yes. It's a 2703D uh, court order um, under the 2730D. Is there a court order than 180 days? It would be uh, a court order. A court order yes. If Hotmail keeps all of that, which I seriously doubt they do. Okay, so Hotmail, it's not all that safe. I want to thank